Good morning and welcome to the October 25th, 2023 City Council meeting. We'll begin with the invocation followed by the pledge. If you'll please stand. Dear Heavenly Father, I just thank you for today. I thank you for the, the change of the season and the change of the leaves and just fall being here and upcoming holidays and just uh, the excitement in the air. Just uh, thank you for this council. Thank you for this city. Just ask for a hedge of protection to keep us all safe and to protect our community. Just thank you for everything. Thank you for our families. In your son's name we pray. Amen. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, we'll begin with the minutes from September the 27th. Move to approve. Second. Got a motion by Wynn, second by Curtis. Any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. A1, Kyle. Good morning, Mayor and Council. Good morning. Uh, this first item is a recognition of the city's um, awardance, or, or the city was awarded the Planning Excellence from the American uh, Planning Association, Texas chapter. This is the ninth consecutive year that the city has been awarded this, uh, this recognition. Uh, it is uh, in recognition of the city's commitment to quality uh, planning and uh, planning efforts, as well as uh, the support for training of its uh, professional staff and uh, planning commission. And so with that, the city or staff is honored to uh, present, present to the city council the the ninth consecutive uh, certificate of achievement for planning and excellence from the Texas American Planning Association. Kyle, good job. As we, we took pictures down there a minute ago, so I don't think we take we don't have any action no. on this, do we? Nope. <clears throat> Just congratulations. 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 You guys <laughs> do a great job. Thank you. Thank you. P1. Kate. Good morning, Mayor and Council. So um, before you today, uh, I would request that the City Council consider receiving a presentation from Garver Engineers on the Wastewater Treatment Master Plan. So as you know, the work that was required by the consent decree uh, encompasses the wastewater collection system and the lift stations, but that's the only portion of it that it really covered. This wastewater treatment plant master plan covers a very crucial part of the system, which is the plants where we treat the wastewater once it's conveyed to them. So um, this included evaluation and future planning for the wastewater treatment plants. So in order to take this very important step in the growth of our city, we issued a, re a request for qualifications in 2021 um, to qualified engineering firms. Garber was selected as the most qualified firm to perform this analysis, and they began the master planning process. So today, Lance Clement, project engineer with Garver, he is here to present to you uh, the process and the recommendations from the master plan. And with that, I'll turn it over to Lance. Good morning, Mayor. Good morning, Council. Thank you all so much for having me here. We're extremely excited to present the results of this study. We'll go high level, uh, step by step through a process to get to the end result. But as Kate mentioned, this has been a two-year process, and we couldn't be more happy with how it turned out. Uh, we enjoyed working with your dedicated water utility staff during this process, Kate and her group, Tiffany and her group, and Mike and his group. Uh, throughout the whole process, I've got to say that your staff was one of the most engaged water utility staff that we've worked with for a project of this scale. You know, data requests, things like that would get turned around within a day. As soon as we requested the information, it was in our court. They were side by side with us out in the field through all of the plant tours that we did. Can't speak enough to how dedicated your staff were throughout this entire process. So kudos to them. Uh, this wastewater master plan was developed using our 10 step master planning process. You can see those 10 steps listed out on the screen. I'll take you high level through each one of those 10 steps briefly over the course of this presentation. But this defined process allows us to reach our end result, which is actionable information. So we want to get to the end and come back from that plan with information we can act on. So that plan doesn't just go up on the shelf. You can take that and refer to it into the future and refine it as needed going forward. 
So the first step of that plan is to start with outlining the goals and objectives. We worked with your staff. We identified what their key drivers were for this plan and what they would consider a successful master plan after we completed it. You can see samples of that listed before you. There was a whole host of goals that we had to refer back through as we went through that process to make sure we were checking those boxes and didn't lose sight of the big picture. We complete a desktop exercise to review historical data. So there you can see uh, an example of a graph that would be located within that report. We're looking at your historical plant performance so that we can understand how your system is unique in the uh, wastewater receiving stream that comes into the plant and also how your plants <coughs> perform and what it's discharging to the stream. So it's not just a, uh, a rubber stamp for each plant. We want to make sure that we're customizing our calculations to exactly what you have out there in the field. Our team conducted staff interviews and condition assessments of your facilities. Uh, there you can see some uh, photos from your facilities. As I mentioned, we worked hand in hand with Mike and his staff to go through each facility, look at your assets, compare those to your record drawings, and compare what you actually have in the field and what and how those units are performing. We developed a heat map of your most critical processes in need of replacement. Here's an example of uh, how we graph all those dots represent an existing asset or an existing process out at your treatment plants. We rank those on likelihood of failure on the y-axis, uh, consequence of failure on the x-axis, and that red area that you see is your most critical assets that are most critically at risk of failing throughout those treatment processes. We did that at both of those plant locations, identified those highest risk elements, and prioritized those in need of replacement within these plant-wide CIPs. Our linear projection approach to use 2020 flow and census data to collect an average usage based on a linear growth trend. So that now that we know your existing treatment plants, which you see on the left on that graph, um, west side wastewater treatment plant and south side wastewater treatment plant, now we, that we know what's out at those existing plants and how they're performing, we need to look to the future. So we worked with your staff, with your planning staff, and identified what your future population would be within our planning horizon and then make sure that we accounted for that future flow rate coming into those plants with any of our proposed projects. We also used a growth area approach for population densities uh, to calculate. So we know y'all have specific areas of town that are growing more rapidly than others. We wanted to make sure we were capturing that and flowing that to the correct treatment plant. Both approaches were compared and that linear approach was selected because it was the most conservative with your ultimate flow rate, as you see there, on an average day of 21.8 million gallons a day. We then created computer models to evaluate current and future conditions. We look at that on a desktop basis compared to that historical data and make sure that the plan is operating within that computer model like it's operating in the field so we can run iterations once we develop that. We then look at future flow and loadings and compare that to the current treatment capacities. Those blue bars are what we calculated your current plant to be capable of treating. The red line is what that plant needs to be capable of in the future. And we identify alternatives to address those capacity gaps. So all those red bars you see are projects that we identified to get you to those future flow rates. Our CIP projects were combined with dependencies and close proximity together into larger projects. I know uh, we've had detailed discussions with Kate and her staff about whether we can phase these projects. All those different colored items that you see on those uh, charts are actually different projects that we broke up into different phases of expansions or improvements where it made sense to group those projects together. So that was a significant amount of effort through the master planning process. We also looked at a new wastewater treatment plant in high resolution to determine if it made sense to start construction on one now or wait until the future whenever uh, development would facilitate the need for that future treatment plant. Alternative one, which would be to uh, focus our improvements on that south side uh, wastewater treatment plant, proved to be the lowest probable construction cost and that was the recommended path forward. Each CIP project was provided with total project costs reflected in 2023 dollars We've got cut sheets with justification for each of these costs and each of these projects within that master plan. It goes into a lot more detail on the background for what's included with each of those line items, what we've budgeted for, 
and any room for additional value engineering that we can do at each of those uh, facilities. And then all findings and recommendations to address your near-term needs and growth over the next 30 years are summarized in the master plan report. So that is the large volume of material if you ever feel like uh, diving into the weeds on it. Happy to share it with you, but we can't speak enough for the opportunities uh, that your staff gave us to work closely with them, receive input directly, um, reflect that within the <coughs> master plan, and provide a document that we both agree is the best path forward for the city. So very pleased with the end result. And we're also happy to report that some of the improvements have already been implemented. Throughout this process, there were several times where at the existing treatment plants, some of that equipment's already on its last leg, and there was a time at the west side treatment plant where uh, the equipment did fail, and so by having those desktop models already developed, we were able to implement immediate improvements that will serve the plant now, and also post-construction phase, we can repurpose that equipment that the plant has bought to use at a later project. So it was money well saved by having that plan already in place, and uh, kudos to Mike and his staff for jumping through hoops to make that emergency repair happen and keep the plant functional. With that, open it up for any questions y'all may have. Thank you all so much for the opportunity. Any questions for Lance? Lance, I've got a couple. Um, when you went through the three alternatives uh, regarding the South Side wastewater treatment facility, uh, and, and you said that holding off on building a new one is, is the right way to go. By increasing capacity at the south side plant, how far down the road does that get us? Does it get us to 2050? Does it get us past that amount? And what would the capacity be increased to? Yes, sir. Um, so the exact number, don't believe we show on the screen. It was a 20 year uh, life cycle or a 20 year expansion uh, horizon. So it gets you through the 20 years, I believe it was around 11 MGD uh, for the uh, build out of that drainage basin. And a big uh, consideration within that evaluation of the future Greenfield plant was collection system improvements. So uh, the plants that we're considering, the growth areas that we're considering, several of those were a significant uh, distance away from where that Greenfield location would be. And so the pipeline costs alone to get it to that location um, outweighed what the cost would be to improve the south side treatment plant. That makes sense. Yes. So is capital that you can spend at that treatment plant or spend it on conveyance and then after conveyance you'd still have to spend it on treatment at that Greenfield site. Right. How um, and just just from my knowledge, how long does it take to build a new plant if we ever get to that point down the road? That's a great question. It all depends on really the time frame that you have in place. Um, so we work with uh, cities throughout Texas. You know the rapid pace of development. Developers are coming in. They may want to see treatment within a year. Um, you've got options from whether you lease equipment temporarily uh, within six months to a year. Uh, you can have treatment available. Uh, ideally, if we have a well thought through design and we know it's going to be a permanent installation, typically that's about a three year process. Does that include uh, acquisition of right away or is that taking into consideration right away is already required? That would include acquisition and right away. Okay. And a lot of that will be dependent on how far you're coming from with the flow. So how long that pipeline will take to get to the plant. Sure. Um, and then also what we've seen lately within Texas is electrical coordination. So if we don't have a significant electrical provider at the site, that could typically take one to two years. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions for Lance? Yeah, Lance. The this study, the, the time horizon on this is 30 years? You're looking 30 years out or 20 years? Yeah, uh, 25 years. 25 years. Yes, sir. You remember, do you remember what the population projection was on that? 140? Sure, I can 140. pull that out. <coughs> there we go. Uh, 2052 projected population. Uh, that was a 30 year horizon. 30? Yes, okay. Sorry. That's what, that's what I Sorry about that. That's all right. So, yeah, and. Uh, I, I'm guessing this isn't optional. I mean, we're going to we're going to have to do something. Would, wouldn't you agree? Yes, sir. Yeah. So it's really two components. One is your existing conditions. That's the first thing, and especially at West Side, we Those critical items. That exactly. You uh, we saw it as we were going through the master plan with that aeration basin failing. We know that that equipment, multiple components on there, are critical 
parts of the plant where all the flow goes through that process and that equipment's old and there's no backup. So we know we'll need to replace it. That's the first component of it. And then the second component is the growth. So the growth is coming, but you also have the condition the aspect of it. <clears throat> yeah, and that I think that's also a testament to the efforts we did through the phasing and prioritization. We knew we needed to focus on the existing equipment that was about to fail first. That's the highest priority. And if we're phasing the project, we can phase in that growth after we address the most critical urgent needs first. I think one of the biggest things I learned in this process is that we think South Tyler growth is something new the last 20, 30 years, but the South Side plant was built in the 1950s. So it is time for us to spend money after 70 years of not putting that money back into it, so. Yes, sir, I would agree. And also I'll echo what I said at the beginning of the presentation. It was very apparent to us that we're touring those facilities like you said, 70 years old, typically the life cycle on those is 40 years, but the plant staff are so dedicated and they're working with what they have that those, even though they're old and they're on their last leg, plant staff are making those operate and still meeting the treatment goals that TCEQ requires. So huge kudos to the efforts that they're doing to keep those plants operational. Not, not just that, but sometimes when it rains heavily, I mean, they're, they're standing in water and so the conditions that they're working in and still getting the job done is, is amazing. Absolutely. That yeah. West Side Influent lift station has been flooded several times in its emergency situations. Mm -hmm. That's one of the primary projects we identified at West Side was to address that so you don't have an emergency critical facility like that go underwater during those high flow situations. Yeah. Any other thoughts, questions? Mm -hmm. Well, thanks for the presentation. Uh, I don't think most people realize that when they flush their toilet or water goes down your drain, where it goes. Where it goes. That's right. And it, it, it's a complex operation and it's not cheap. Yeah. But you gotta make these improvements and, and we get it. But So thank you for the presentation, Kate. Thank you to you and your whole crew for, for keeping on top of things. Okay, thank you, thank thank you, you so much. much. All right, Z1, Kyle. Hello again. Uh, this first item is a zone change request from RPO Planned Office or Restricted Professional Office District to POD Planned Office District. This is on uh, South Park Drive. The applicant is requesting the zone change to use the, the, the building as a daycare facility. Uh, the surrounding properties to the, to the north are zoned commercial and are uh, developed with uh, commercial uses and then to the west is a uh, office as well and then to the south uh, is a mixture of uh, multifamily and duplex uh, zoning and then to the east is currently undeveloped but it is zoned for multifamily the uh, the request is consistent with the future land use guide identifying this this, this area around troop in the loop and uh, Paluxy, or Paluxy in the loop as a mixed use center and so it, it will provide uh, daycare services for the, the area. The, uh, the zoning would be approved with a written narrative, which essentially uh, establishes the, uh, the standards as RPO, which is typical of uh, uh, office uh, area. And then of the notices that were sent out, we did receive one in opposition uh, with a protest calculation of just over 9%. Uh, the main concern there was just additional traffic associated with a daycare facility. Uh, this area is is uh, either developed or could be developed with more commercial uses and multifamily uses, so it could be more of a, a complement to that area. To that area. Uh, and with that in mind, the Planning Commission, by a uni unanimous vote, recommended approval. Any questions for Kyle? Make a motion to approve Z1. Second. Uh, motion by Nichols, second by Wynn. Any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. Aye. Uh, opposed? Motion carries. Z2. This is a site plan amendment for a for a planned multifamily district. This is on Fraser Street. Um, the surrounded properties to the north and east are multifamily, uh, but are developed with office uses. 
Um, and then to the south is also an office. Uh, to the west is AR, Adaptive Reuse, which is the location of a, it appears to be a single family home, uh, which could be used as an office or, or a single family home. Um, the, this request is consistent with the, the future land use guide. Back in 2019, the applicant, uh, or maybe a previous applicant, uh, recommended this site, or was approved for this site plan here, which had uh, two buildings with uh, uh, eight units total. And so these were essentially four duplex uh, areas. And uh, as you can see, the, the, uh, the parking lot was in the, re at the rear of the property there. Uh, the applicant's proposing to uh, amend the site plan to, to what you see here, which is uh, six units on the property. So it's a de decrease in the number of, of uh, units in the property, and it's more of a uh, more of a townhome attached uh, style uh, on the property there with uh, driveways and, and whatnot. And so the um, the applicant is proposing or, or keeping the the standard of a six foot uh, privacy fence on the west side of the property adjacent to the to the, to the home over there. And then the setbacks are 10 feet on the northeast and south and 20 feet on the west uh, where that fence is. Of the notices that, that we sent out, we didn't receive any in favor or in opposition to the request and the plan of commission by a uni unanimous vote recommended approval. Any questions for Kyle? Move to approve Z2. Second. Got a motion by Wynn, second by McKellar. Any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. C3. <coughs> right. This is a zone change request from, multi, from a M1 Industrial District to C2 General Commercial District. This is on at the southeast corner of uh, the West Loop and Earl Campbell Parkway. Uh, the applicant is requesting to <sighs> downzone this to allow for uh, the property to be developed with office uses. M1 actually restricts office uses, but commercial zoning does not. And so, uh, and this is more in keeping with what you see on the West Loop there with the commercial uh, land uses, uh, Sam, Sam's Club is to the west, and then some offices to the, to the north, um, north and east. The, uh, this request would amend the future land use guide to general commercial, but it is um, more in keeping with the, the area that you, or the development that you see in that area. Uh, it's currently undeveloped, and the applicant plans to develop the the, uh, the property with uh, a mixture of offices or other retail uses on the property. Of the notices that were sent out, zero were returned in favor or in opposition uh, to this request, and the planning commission by a 7-0 vote recommended approval. Any questions for Kyle? Second. Got a motion by McGee, second by McKellar. Any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. Uh, aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Thanks, Kyle. Thanks. Oh, 01. <coughs> Steve. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you. Okay, I'll be presenting uh, 01 with a slight update to Chapter 12 in our ordinances. Basically, we are nearing completion of a great uh, security upgrade project at the airport. And one of the biggest changes that will impact users of the airport um, includes completely changing the access control points. What you see here in the middle, that is the new access uh, control module that will be used for folks to scan an ID card to gain access to the airport. And previously, airport users would have to use an ID badge similar to what you see on the left paired with a swipe card, which you see on the right. That card added a $15 cost uh, to users of the airport. What this new system allows us to do is use a, an all-in-one badge, which basically is a chipped card. However, that card does have a slightly increased cost, and we think it's a great opportunity to kind of capture some of those, the cost, the increased costs, as well as some of the staff labor that goes into producing these, ID, these new ID cards. This gives you a look at our current and our proposed fees. I will give you a moment to digest those and then take any questions you have on the proposed change. Is that it? Any questions for Steve? Yeah, Steve. Th so this new badging is just going to be getting to the secure side of the airport? Uh, at every gate around the perimeter can use a, this type of a badge. So it gets you into the AOA as well as uh, if you have the correct credentials into the secure area into the commercial operations. Okay. Can you go back to the picture of the badge? 
looks like a mugshot. <laughs> <laughs> I feel I sorry. Did, I did I feel ask. <clears throat> can, you, can you have Virginia smile? I, I did verify that we don't have a badge on file for you, sir, because I did want that to be the picture, but Virginia graciously offered her a uh, picture since she had a good hair day. That yeah, day. well, I feel sorry for Virginia. All right, any other questions for Steve? So moved. Second. Uh, got a motion by McKellar, second by Curtis. Any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Great, thank you. Tell Virginia we love her. Right. Yeah, she's she's, she's in the back. back. She just heard she's you. Here. Is she back there? Yeah. <laughs> Great picture. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. David. All right, good morning, Mayor good morning, and morning. Council. Uh, I am David Gibson. I'm the Chief Building Official uh, here. I'm here today representing the Building Services Department for the City of Tyler, and we are here today to discuss Chapter 6 of the City of Tyler Ordinances, specifically the ICC Code Standards. Uh, currently, the City has adopted and utilizes the 2015 International Code Council for the ICC Standards. David, can I interrupt you real quick? Are you are you going to be speaking to 02 all the way through 011? All the way through, yes. Okay, sir. so this will carry cover. This that. this will cover it. Okay, all. yes, sir. Um, so currently, the city has adopted and utilizes the 2015 International uh, Code Council standards, along with the 2017 National Electrical Code standards, for permitting, reviewing, and inspections. Uh, the ICC and the NEC updates code standards on a three-year cycle. Um, the insurance services offices, the ISO, is a standard most insurance companies and FEMA uses in determining insurance rates as well as government response to natural disasters. Uh, the ISO surveys participating cities and will score them accordingly to many factors. Uh, there are two ISO ratings. One is for the fire department and the other one uh, includes the building services and inspections. Uh, today, we're just strictly talking about the building services and inspections. Um, a favorable ISO rating requires a municipality to be within two code cycles of current state adopted building code additions. Uh, with Tyler currently being under the 2015 cycle, that puts us out of the, the two-year cycle uh, in order to receive the most current uh, favorable ratings. So today, we're looking at the following code standards. Um, the 2021 International Building Code, the 2021 International Residential Code, the 21 International Fire Code, 21 International Existing Building Code, the International Energy Conservation Code, International Mechanical Code, International Plumbing Code, uh, International Fuel Gas Code, and the National Electrical Code. The building services staff formed a code adoption task force to review, discuss, and make recommendations reporting, regarding the 2021 ICC code standards. The task force included members of the building community, and these members were uh, Sam Mosaic, he was the chair with Mosaic Homes, John Nix with Nix Builders, David Socia with Sidar Builders, Reuben Watson, Watson Plumbing, Dennis Chambers, Chambers Electric, Max Slicker with SC Architects, Corey Guidry with Fitzpatrick Architects, Rich Enfield with Maddox Mechanical Services, and Ben Stovall with Nix Builders. Uh, the task force met weekly for 12 weeks, approximately an hour and a half each week. Uh, the group discussed significant changes in all proposed code books, including the International Fire Code. Uh, the group had a lot of open discussions and a lot of varied opinions as well. Uh, we did come away with some very valuable input and the recommendations regarding the code changes. The Code Adoption Task Force approved recommending to the Tyler City Council the adoption of the 2021 International Code Council's Code Standards along with the 2023 National Electrical Code with amendments. Um, after the task force met, um, made their reviews and recommendations, we then convened the Construction Board of Adjustment and Appeals. Uh, this is a seven member board, uh, public board uh, with members being appointed by the City Council. Uh, 
those members included uh, David Socia, he's the chairman of the board, Max Slicker, which both of those were also on the uh, task force, Alfred Pate III, Gian Dietz, James Brooks, John McKinney, and Will Duran. And Will was not present during this, this particular meeting. Uh, the board held an open public meeting at the Tyler Development Center. The code changes were discussed along with the recommendations of the task force. There were no other persons present at the meeting to speak for or against the code changes. And by a six to zero vote, the board unanimous, unanimously approved recommending to the Tyler City Council the adoption of the 2021 International Code Council Code Standards along with the 2023 National Electoral Code and Amendments. The Code Task Force Construction Board of Adjustment and Appeals uh, along with city staff, recommends an effective date of January 1st, 2024, to begin utilizing these adopted codes. City staff has been offering educational opportunities since March of this year um, in anticipation of the code updates. We have held multiple lunch and learn type of uh, sessions at uh, Tyler Area Builders Association with lots of um, all the, a lot of the builders and, and contractors were present uh, through all of these. We held uh, several of those meetings. Um, and we, we presented each book during different sessions. Uh, we also have uh, scheduled an energy conservation code presentation <coughs> later this month, uh, next week in fact, uh, where we do have currently 100 plus participants signed up uh, this will be presented by Spear, which is a DFW company that goes around to municipalities and helps kind of, they're, they're experts in, in this field here. Um, and we will continue to educate uh, additional educational opportunities in the future as well. We, we plan on going back to TABA. Uh, we have some additional lunch and learn scheduled through them once we get everything figured out <coughs> where we're going. I would like to personally thank all the people who voluntarily gave of their time to assist uh, the city of Tyler in this endeavor. I would also like to thank the building services staff along with the fire marshal staff who helped in this process. It was a huge team effort. I would also like to thank the city leaders uh, for their support of the building services staff. We would not be able to do what we do without that support. That's very important to us. Uh, the reason for building inspections in a nutshell uh, is to ensure safe buildings. Uh, inspectors protect the health, safety, and welfare of the public through inspections of construction to verify that it meets the minimum acceptable standards. Uh, it is said that when we as building inspectors do our jobs, nothing happens. No buildings fall down, nobody gets hurt, everybody gets out. Uh, so in conclusion, the Tyler Building Services staff, along with the fire marshal staff, recommends that the Tyler City Council adopts the 2021 International Code Standards along with the 2023 uh, National Electrical Code along with proposed amendments uh, which have been included in, in your packets. So that's the end of my speech. <laughs> Any questions on that? So when do these go into effect? We are looking and proposing that January 1st is, is the date that we will start utilizing it. Everything that is uh, submitted before January 1st will be reviewed and permitted and inspected under the 2015 codes. So if somebody comes in, if, if they've been working on a project for, sometimes they, you know, they're, they're working on it for a year or so, um, as long as they come in by December 31st, we will be under the 15 code standards. And additional, the subcontractors, um, if they, say they, they come in on uh, February and, and pull their permits at that date, it will still be under the umbrella of the building permit, which will be 2015 standards. All right. Any other questions for David? David, I got a couple. Um, first of all, first presentation in front of council, right? Uh, yes, sir. Yeah, good, good job, thank you very much. Yeah. Um, <laughs> thank you. Uh, Two questions. Um, obviously, we're doing this because of the ISO standards and how that affects the city. Do you know 
what if we adopt this, how that does affect the ISO? Is it a couple points increase, um, point increase? You know, what, what kind of increase it would give us? Yes, currently, uh, well, in the past, uh, we, we have been at a five. Um, in, in our code, um, four and five is considered really great. I know in the fire code, uh, and they're, they've uh, done a lot to accomplish a one, and that is where they want to be. But for us, a four or five is, is the place we, we're looking at. Uh, so we've always been a five over the last, I think we last updated in 2018, we've been at a five ISO rating. Um, the ISO surveyor came into our office back in December of last year, and and we went through a long ordeal of, of surveying of where we're at, the codes we're using, the, the, the staff that we have, the, the skills that we have, and, and the certifications we have. That put us temporarily at a nine, and the higher, the worse you are. Um, he did tell us at that time that as long as we adopted a new, the, and got within the proper code cycle, that that would be resurveyed and we would go back down to our uh, previous score of five. Okay. All right. Uh, second question. You mentioned the Construction Board of Adjustments uh, voted unanimously six to zero to approve. Uh, when this was at the round table level, was that a unanimous decision as well? Pardon me? When it was at the round table level, was that a unanimous recommendation as well? Yes, sir. The, the task force, um, I can see we, we met for 12 weeks um, and there was a lot of opinions and, and a lot of um, discussions about you know the, the significant changes and, and the amendments and, and they they came up with most of the uh, adopted amend or the proposed amendments um, we, we had a we would go through each book and then we would kind of put things in a parking lot uh, to, to discuss later on um, af after we went through everything, we went back to that parking lot and, and had, that's where we had a lot of the discussions as far as what to uh, adopt, how to amend it, and, and how it was going to affect the city. So uh, they was unanimous. That it was a product that everybody agreed, agreed upon um, to, to uh, the amendments that, that we have included in your packets. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank I you. have a question. Yes, ma'am. Were there any members of PWB involved in your task force? I didn't see any names of any of the ones. I'm sorry? Uh, the professional women's builders, were there any of them involved in this project? Um, there was Gian Dietz. She is on our construction board of adjustment. Okay. Um, she, she was uh, part of that group, uh, and she is, um, she, she is a member of, of that board. It's a city council. It's a public board. Uh, so she was the only female on, on that board. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions before yeah. we... David, I uh, appreciate the hard work, that, yeah. uh, especially the code adoption task force. I talked to several of those guys, and yes. uh, the parking lot discussions were some of the most interesting ones. They was. <laughs> um, and probably more heated. They get it. They don't like it. It is going to drive up you know, building costs a little bit, but it keeps that ISO rating. From your inspector side, uh, once uh, one one twenty four gets in, and you have some subs that may not be as versed on the new codes, are y'all going to kind of help them in a little grace period on? Yes, sir. Uh, there will not be uh, January first. It will not be. You do it this way here. Uh, what we've talked about as staff is uh, we we will discuss uh, the the changes if if we see any that that you know. That, of course, life safety, it, there's no issues on that. But, you know, there, there may be some that you, you kind of have to, to work your way around. Uh, so we, we will be working with contractors on that. We, we can uh, approve inspections with uh, kind of exceptions. And, okay, you're, you're in 15, you were good, but now you got to change something. We're going to go ahead and, and let you move forward. But... Keep in mind, you know, the next time or two that you're, you're going to have to make these changes. Uh, and, and again, this is something that we have been really in uh, 
conversation with these contractors about it all. Uh, we do have a pretty good working repertoire with them. Um, all of our inspectors are tradesmen, and so they pretty much know all, all of the uh, contractors. Each, each one has their own specific uh, group, electrical, mechanical, plumbing. So they, we, we do really have a pretty good repertoire with, with these subcontractors, and, and we have been doing a lot of talking and discussion and educating with them, and, and I think they're all on board. Um, like you said, it, it will be a, a little bit of a cost increase. Uh, that's everything. Uh, but I, I think when you balance everything out, that it, it, it's a good product that, that's coming out. Um, again, you know, uh, the, the codes all come from a matter of safety. Uh, there's two reasons for a building code. One is personal protection and one is property protection. So that's always the biggest issues there. And, and so when you kind of balance those two out, the cost is, is really minimal. And, and I think uh, the group that we had with the construction task force was, uh, as you saw, we, we had everybody represented. And, and, you know, that part was discussed, you know, what would it increase, you know, how will it benefit us? And um, I think it come up to a point where everybody's realized that, you know, yeah, it's probably, it is something that, that we need to do and it's something that, you know, is, is beneficial to the city and to the citizens. For a homeowner building a house or for a commercial property, general public, what change, if any, will they see? Or is everything behind the sheetrock? Um, to be honest with you, the Energy Conservation Code is probably the biggest um, change that's, that's going to happen, uh, and that's the reason why we, we've opted to, to go with a, a presentation next week. Uh, we, we've got this company coming out of Dallas that, that works with this. Um, we, we have, oh goodness, about 125 people. I think we're, we're going to be over at the Brookshire Center. Um, and you know, when I first started putting that together, I thought, yeah, we may have 25, 30 people, but within the first two days, we had 100 that was wanting to sign up. So I think that part's gonna be really good to, to get that out in the open. Um, that's usually the, the biggest, uh, sig most significant changes, and, and that's gonna have to do with the, actually from the ground up. Uh, so a lot of people are gonna have to kind of look at their designs and figure out how there's that code will allow you to uh, use several different options uh, there's a prescriptive there's a, all different ways that you can do it to be in compliance um, and there, there's ways you know you can trade off a, a better um, a higher value window for less insulation or you can put more insulation in uh, to, to account for other you know, stuff. So um, that's going to be the, the most difficult process that we have. But again, I, I think that, that, you know, at the first it's going to be difficult. It's, it's going to be a chore. Uh, that is a state mandated book. That, that's the only book in the series that we have that is not, like I mentioned before, the codes deal in personal protection and property protection. That book, of course, it, it doesn't. Um, it, it's a state mandated, or it's actually a federal government mandated book. That same, same as everything, you know, it, it, and it, it'll help. It, it, it'll cut the cost of, you know, the energy for consumption of the house. The water consumption of the house will be lower. So it, it's actually a good thing, but that's gonna be the hardest part. So when you talk about parking lot, we explain what that means. Parking lot was just something that, that when we was going through these significant changes in the books, um, and, and I don't know who came up with it. It might have been Sam Mosaic or Socha or one of them. They come up with a parking lot. Um, when, when we would come up on that particular, on, on any uh, significant change and uh, to keep things moving forward, we would just, okay, we may need to put that subject there in the parking lot, and then that's when we would come back to it. So it, it was just a way of, of 
keeping things together to where we can address it later on during the sessions. I want to just clarify that so people didn't think we were all having meetings out in the parking <laughs> no, we lot. We weren't out in the parking lot talking. <laughs> So, so, David, it's my understanding it's a three-year cycle for the International Business uh, Building Code. So it's 2015, then 18, yes, then 21, and then our number shot up yes, after sir. that because we were in a, we're like two and a half years or yes, two and a half cycles out yes, right now. That, so, that's what it was. And as long as um, the ISO, I'm not sure how often they do their surveys of the cities, um, but when they contacted us. Um, in 2022, last year, December, that, that's when we, we met with them. And, and like I said, their survey included a lot of stuff. Um, our, our staff qualifications, our certifications, our continuing education, our office staff, um, how, how we work on things. And, and, but the code cycles were the biggest hickeys that, that got us. Um, being out of that cycle was, was, it was automatically, well, you know, we, we got we got to do some talking on that one. So when we adopt this officially January 1st, 2014, within, at the end of 2014, one cycle will have passed. We'll be from, oh, I'm sorry, 2024, I'm a decade <laughs> on. So 2021 to 2024, one cycle will be ended about this time next year. So do we have plans on maybe at that time starting this process, say the first of 20, 25 well to to historically get in, in the city we we have not adopted every three years it's something that we may want to look at uh it would certainly be a lot easier uh to to go up you know adjust from one book to the next book uh that's something that that uh us as uh the inspection staff would love that sure um because like the this time here, we had to jump up two code cycles. So we had to go significant changes from 15 to 18, and then the significant changes from 18 to 21. So, I mean, it, it's something that I personally would like to see uh, us update a little bit more often. Uh, currently, I, I think the state will adopt generally the code, like the 2024 code is coming up, and I think they generally adopting the 20 or, or February-ish type uh, part of the year. So uh, current, uh, the 21 is, a, is the most current that we can get into. Right, so this might help lessen some sticker shock maybe if- It could. If, and it might also promote change, more change happening more often and more acceptability and realization that we're going to change as, and progress as we go. Yes, sir, it could. Uh, I know the last time we updated, it was like from 2008 to 2015, so we were way out of cycle on that. Um, but this one here, you know, where the two cycles out, and um, personally, uh, I think it would be a good deal that if we adopted each, end of, you know, each three years myself, that's, that's Thank you. I, I would love to see that. All right, I've got one card from Bob Brewer. Cassandra, can you put him on the clock, please? Yeah. <laughs> We've got somewhere to be at 11. I'm sorry? Go ahead. Can you um, state your name and address for the record? Anyway, thank you, Mayor and Council. And I just have to say, I love coming in here. This, this, this space is just so perfect and organized and clean and well run. I really do love it. So I came here, I'm here as a friend of the court. I'm mainly here for the word international that appears like eight times in, in the agenda of the old. And I'm here to remind everybody about uh, our first sentence of US law in the courthouse downtown. No human law should be suffered to contradict creation or the Bible, and any that do are subject to failure and removal and punishment. So, uh, when we when we make rules, it really needs to be with the consent of you guys who swore an oath to protect and defend the Constitution against enemies, foreign and domestic 
And where we have come to right now, we have a lot of foreign enemies, and many of those have entered into our domestic situation. You know, education, you know, transportation, so many things. And we followed so many guidelines that were never laws, according to jabs and spacing and mask and closures and just stuff that was made up by foreign entities. World Health Organization is one of those that seemingly are law, but are absolutely not. So I just, you know, I, I want to encourage everybody to know uh, the origin of our laws. The one in the Constitution that pertains most to this is Article One, Section 10, the last clause. The clauses immediately immediately above that are being just drastically violated at this time. I'm not so, so sure about the last one, which all this is, pertains to. It says, no state shall without consent of Congress uh, enter into any agreement uh, with another, with a foreign power. So I would just feel a whole lot more comfortable if this was instead of a international code, if it was a Texas code or at least a national code, and bring it closer to we the people that can keep an eye on what is happening because a lot of bad stuff's gonna happen real soon, and, and if we don't know and control what's going on at our most local level, uh, it's, uh, it's gonna be too bad. So anyway, once again, I appreciate uh, this body and this building, and I hope you hang on to it forever. <laughs> and uh, thank you for this opportunity. Well, Bob, thanks for coming. I tell you, you always have a different twist on things, so it's always uh, interesting, and, and uh, appreciate you being here. Uh, okay, any other questions or comments for David before we go? So, okay. So I'll make a motion, and if I can, I don't know if it's, could, if we can look. Would be great. Quick question before you make a motion. Do we have to vote on these separately? That's what I was going to say is can I lump them all together? I, I would recommend that you vote on them each separately. Okay. 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 Well, then never mind. Okay, get ready. <laughs> <laughs> you can still make a motion on those. Two through <laughs> Make a motion to approve O2. Second. <laughs> all right. Motion by Nichols, second by Haney. Any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. Uh, I make a motion to approve O3. Second. <laughs> Motion by Nichols, second by Haney. Any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Motion to approve of four. Second. <laughs> Motion by Nichols, second by Haney. Any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Motion to so approve of five. Second. Oh, okay. <laughs> we got to slow down. Okay. We got a motion by McKellar, second, <laughs> second by Haney. Any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Second. Uh, <laughs> not my birthday. Okay, we're at 06. 06. Six. Motion to approve 06. Second. We've got a motion by Nichols, second by Haney. Any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion, motion to approve 07. Second. Second mo motion by Nichols, second by Wynn. Mm -hmm. Any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Oh, motion eight. carries. Motion. Motion by McKellar, second by. Second. <laughs> McGee. <laughs> Any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. Motion by Wynn. Second. Second by Haney. Any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Motion carried. I'm going to get a drink of water. <laughs> <laughs> okay, O10. Second. Who made the motion? Second. Keller. Uh, motion by McKellar, second by McGee. Any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. aye. Uh, opposed? Motion carries. O11. Second. Who made the motion? Motion. <laughs> uh, motion by Nichols, <laughs> second by Haney. Any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. Aye. Uh, opposed? Motion carries. Cassandra, Cassandra you got all that? <laughs> <laughs> Leanne was hoping you'd go on with him one. Um, so. All right, thank you, David. Good, good job. Thank you, thank you Deborah, David. are we okay? <laughs> All right, Leanne. Good morning, Mayor. Good morning, Council. Good morning. Good morning. We are excited to move forward with our next park renovation, which will be W.E. Winters Park, which is located over off Peach Street. The city will work with MHS Planning to develop a design plan for the park. The project will be funded by the Keep Todd Beautiful Parks Capital Improvement Fund through revenue collected from the landfill access fee. We also were awarded a matching grant through Game Time, 
and the Texas Recreation and Park Society Program Funding Initiative. MHS Planning helped us with the renovation of PT Cole Park, and we feel confident in their ability to help move this project forward. So it is recommended that the City Council consider authorizing the City Manager to enter into an agreement with MHS Planning and Design LLC in the amount of 64600 to prepare the W.E. Winters Park Design Plan. Awesome. Any questions for Leanne? No, I'm just excited to see this park finally mm -hmm. get started. Me too. I think we've been working on this since I got on council in 2018. <laughs> So it's good to see it, though. So I guess that's a motion. You better know it. That being said. Yes, sir. <laughs> you better know it. All right. Got a so motion moved. by McGee, second by Curtis. Any further discussion? <laughs> All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Thanks, Leanne. Yeah, I feel pretty ramped up after all those motions and everything else. Now we're gonna, now we're gonna kind of get bogged down with insurance. Yeah, now we're gonna talk about death and dismemberment, but it's yeah. accidental. Yeah, yeah. It's accidental. Death, dismemberment. <laughs> Good morning, Mayor and Council. My name is Janet Aguilar. I'm with the Organizational Development um, Department. This morning I'm here to present Lance. He is our uh, consultant with McGriff, and he's gonna be um, presenting action action items M2 and M3 for your consideration of the award of the bids. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> Mayor, uh, City Council, City Manager, uh, yeah, sorry to bore you to tears here with a couple of uh, agenda items, but we, uh, we were up for our five-year contracts on term life insurance uh, that the city pays for, and then the employees are able to buy additional voluntary life insurance on top of that. And then we did an RFP for voluntary vision insurance as well. Um, so I'm going to just present those two items real quickly. All right. So RFP. Uh, oh, I forgot to mention this is my coworker Ryan Wiggins. Ryan's with, been with McGriff for a year. Uh, actually hired him away from United Healthcare. Um, so he worked very briefly on the city of Tyler's account during the implementation. Uh, for January 1st, but uh, he's been with me a year working on the City of Tyler account, um, so y'all may see him periodically. I'm not going anywhere, but uh, Ryan is uh, involved in the account as well. Okay. Well, sorry about that. Welcome. <laughs> uh, RFP 23-80 on the life insurance. We posted that RFP uh, through the purchasing department on the 22nd of August, and we opened those bids a month later on 927. We received three proposals. So Oaks is our current uh, vendor for life insurance and voluntary life insurance. So they submitted their bid, uh, Mutual of Omaha and Voya uh, were the three bids we received for that. And then on voluntary vision insurance, uh, we posted those a little bit later, uh, the 12th of September, opened those on the 10th of October, and we did receive uh, six bids for vision. So. We analyzed uh, all the bids, both the life insurance bids and the voluntary vision bids, and determined that Oaks, our current vendor for the life insurance, uh, we're coming with a recommendation for that. I want to give you some highlights. Uh, they uh, reduced their basic life premium, which the city pays for, which is great news. We're, uh, you know, I've brought increases to, 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 to the council from time to time, and it's it good to see some numbers in red here for the term life insurance for the city. Uh, really a lot of the other value comes to the employees in the form of uh, additional guarantee issue amounts and uh, increases in their basically the availability for coverage on the voluntary life insurance. So uh, guarantee issue amount for new hires goes from $250,000 to 300,000. Just some brief information on that. When you're a new <coughs> hire for the city of Tyler, You've got the term life insurance, and then once again, the guarantee issue is you can get up to three hundred thousand uh, in the new offer without any questions asked. So y'all could hire somebody that comes here with health conditions and things like that, um, and Oaks is not going to ask them any questions uh, up to three hundred thousand um, dollars. And then they did increase the maximum that the employees can purchase up to from five hundred thousand up to seven hundred and fifty thousand. There is a caveat, it's five times annual salary. Uh, 
uh, is, is one of the other uh, factors of that, that quote. And then we're doing a true open enrollment. So all the employees, regardless of how long you've been here at the city, we're gonna do a brand new open enrollment or Oaks is offering a brand new enrollment up to the $300,000, even if you've been here 10 years. Uh, so that was one of the things that we requested during the RFP, and I think that's great. We, we may have employees here that their, you know, their life situation has changed uh, since they started at the city, and they may have a need to buy additional life insurance or life insurance for the first time. Um, so that, that's gonna be something that we're gonna really highlight during the open enrollment process this year. And, and one of the factors in, in making that recommendation to the council. Um, this is the voluntary vision. Once again, this is employee paid. Uh, we did see a reduction in rates for the employees. So effective January 1st, uh, their rates will be going down. Uh, plan designs remain the same. We are re uh, recommending superior vision uh, remain as the, the vendor. The rates were a factor. The other thing, we have a great network out here. So the employees um, have great access to providers. Uh, for their vision care needs. There were a couple of proposals that maybe showed some a little bit better savings, but when we did a deeper dive, the network of providers that they, the employees have access to was not as good as uh, Superior Vision. We've had Superior in here, even before y'all hired me, y'all uh, had Superior Vision. So they've been a long-term uh, partner uh, with the city. Uh, any, any questions um, about uh, the, these two RFPs? I will highlight just real briefly, uh, they, Superior did give us a four-year rate guarantee uh, as well on the same level of benefits. I think I mentioned that, but I um, want to open it up to questions for the council. So you just, your presentation was for M2 and M3, yes, correct? Sir. So does anybody have any questions for Lance on either of those items were you surprised by the decreases um you know the the, the basic life premium really uh you know it's not a lot that the city pays okay. but really what these vendors want uh, i think the city pays 25 or thirty thousand dollars in premium for the term life but to get access to the employees on the voluntary life that's where a lot of the real money is um, so I was impressed with Oaks that they gave us some sort of reduction on the term life insurance. Um, um, so, so not totally surprised, but uh, it's always nice to get a reduction yeah, on, on uh, the life insurance and the vision. And just a sneak preview, I know a lot of you, I, I come in November and December to do the, the stop loss renewal and we're looking, uh, we had a really rough renewal last year and that's also gonna be looking uh, very favorable uh, for the city. We took on a big increase last year. Awesome. Thank you, Councilman. Mm -hmm. Any other questions for Lance? Mm -hmm. All right, let's uh, take item M2 first. Move, Move to approve M2. Second. Got a motion by Wynn, second by McGee. Any further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries, M3. Move to approve M3. Motion by Curtis, second by McGee. Any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Thanks, Lance. Great to see you, Lance. Welcome, Ryan. Thank you. M4, Darren. Good morning, Darren Jennings, City Engineer, here to present to y'all a new Copeland Road widening project we want to go to design contract started with. Basically, I want to give you a history of the project first right here in that we have we have new Copeland Road does not have a left turn lane from Reek all the way up to Shiloh in, here in town. You may recall that there is, uh, this was identified as a project in need of a left, a continuous left turn lane. We have Cumberland Academy right here in the northwest corner, northeast corner. We have Shadow Road here with a lot of traffic. We have a lot of, we have the Hunters Glen subdivision, excuse me, apartments right here. We have the subdivision of Kings Park. We have another subdivision down here. We have the uh, medical offices along here along with the Providence Park, we have a nursing facility right in here. Here's Reek Road, which tees into it. South of here, we do have a 
can a turn lane, excuse me, a left turn lane. It is not continuous like we are proposing on here. It will be uh, all the way through with no medians. First, it'll just be a striped turn lane. Half cent, uh, this was on the half cent sales tax mm -hmm. project list that was funded last year. It was number 14 of the 18 that were funded. So we put it off starting this project just a little bit, just due to we had a lot of projects starting all at one time for staffing. And we had a couple of projects go over a little bit, so we just held off just a little bit till we got some more revenue in the account. So the scope, initially we are going to, uh, we do have a few things going on here. We have basically this West Mud Creek that bisects the project pretty much. Uh, and we do have, uh, we have the, if you know, may realize, remember there's a Stepping Stones daycare driveway right here that there's a lot of traffic on certain times of the day. We have uh, the creek right here, which does back up. It does flow west. So we're going to, it will be of an analyzing the creek, looking at it, seeing if, how much we need to upsize that culvert. We also have some work downstream. We have some erosion issues. And instead of getting another engineer to look at something right adjacent to this, we're just gonna add that to this project at the same time. So all that, uh, want to kind of show you what it really looks like right now. This is what it looks like with the no turn lane right here. Now what I want to do here is show you we have this culvert basically just cantilevered out in the creek. You can kind of see it a little bit better here highlighting. So in essence, what we have here is just, that's part of the erosion issues downstream. What I'd like to do is just, they're gonna tell us, as just a preliminary engineering report, which gets us to 30% plans, gets us the size of the culvert. We do have some areas of 90 foot right away. We have some areas of 100 foot right away. How much can we fit in there with the existing right away? How much can we not? So then we'll determine how much, if any, right away or even easements, temporary construction easements or anything we would need in this. So and that will get us, they'll also get us a cost estimate for the project, and I did a cost estimate. So with that in mind, I would like to request City Council consider authorizing the city manager to execute a work order with the CT Brandon Corporation for preliminary design phase services for the addition of a continuous left turn lane on New Copeland Road from Shiloh Road south to Reek Road for a cost not to exceed $129,830. Any questions for Darren? Darren, I got one question. There's uh, some traffic signal work that's taking place recently at the intersection of Reek and Copeland. Would this affect that new traffic signal intersection right there? No, we would not want to, ex to, to affect that at all. Uh, Darren, I, I want to compliment you on including the erosion control um, in this work because we, we had an area uh, close, well, probably on the same creek several years ago that was very expensive to repair. So it, it makes a lot of sense to go and take care of that now in the same. Thank same you. They're, they're going to have to analyze upstream and downstream, and it was going to be right adjacent to it. Instead yeah. of having another engineer just take over right there, we get it done. Yeah. Thank you. Good. Any other questions? Move to approve M4. Second. second. Got a motion by Curtis, second by McKellar. Any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. Aye. Uh, opposed? Motion carries. Thanks, Darren. Thank you. All right, we are down to the consent agenda. Uh, do we want to approve as presented? Move to approve the consent agenda as written. Second. Motion by Curtis, second by Haney. Any yeah. further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. City Manager's report. Thank you, Mayor and Council. A few items of note. Earlier today, y'all recognized <clears throat> Uh, the planning and development staff for their hard work as um, and, but one of the things uh, that they've did this also additionally this uh, month is this is National Community Planning Month so they volunteered at the Tyler Senior Center uh, last Friday to start clearing weeds and planting flower beds near the front entrance uh, so the step planners were able to go out there to improve the well-being of all the people living in our community especially our seniors that take part in our senior center uh, and so they were able to go get their hands dirty uh, able to get nice fresh air uh, and enjoy that rather than looking at plans and plats. Uh, and so 
Uh, plan supplies were still waiting for them when they came back, uh, so they had to get involved with those. So if there's additional dirt on your plat, uh, we apologize for that. Um, we also just came off of the uh, Rose Festival this weekend. Um, and we had an incredibly successful Rose Festival, all the different activities. A few things of note though, uh, this was our first year to use the WT Brookshire Conference Center uh, and the grounds in association with the uh, Rose Festival. And we received just really as far as some great comments back. Um, the chair of the Queen's Coronation Ball sent a very nice note uh, stating as far as just how wonderful it was, the activities were, and how hardworking the staff was to make sure that all things were taken care of uh, and that it was an incredible opportunity for everyone involved. Um, also, we want to thank our Rose Garden crews. Uh, you know, it's, we have the Rose Festival, we have all of the, uh, as far as the Queen and all of her court and beautiful dresses and everything, uh, but then you probably see Jose and some of his staff that are, uh, aren't as beautifully dressed um, and also covered in dirt, but they're the ones making sure that everybody is coming into our community uh, or being able to see the beautiful roses that we have at the Rose Garden and all that is there. They planted 114 rose beds in preparation for the Rose Festival, which is in addition to other partial bed renovations. Uh, they also recently completed a new Rose Climber project consisting of planting climbers along the north fence, uh, north fence uh, which will spread and look beautiful for pedestrians and drivers on Front Street as they drive by. So they did just incredible work out there, and we're very proud of our uh, Rose Garden crew and Rose Complex staff. Uh, and then finally, we also have the United Way uh, Drive, uh, the Smith County United Way Drive. Uh, we take part in that every year. Uh, our employees are having their kickoff this week, in fact, uh, for that and into next week. And so we will encourage our employees and others to uh, take part in the United Way. It's a great activity. Um, it's a great organization that benefits all in our community in different ways. Uh, and so we are very excited to be part of that. Next all right. Uh, also, uh, we don't talk about James very much. It's just <laughs> kind of over there being quiet. But it's my understanding that, that James received the J.B. Smith Community Service Award last night at the Greater Tyler Area Realtors Fire Responders Dinner. So I think oh. it's time to give it up to James. <laughs> you always just kind of sit over there, just nice and quiet. <laughs> Thanks for <laughs> keeping us safe. That's right. Uh, any other comments for the city manager before we adjourn? No, sir. All right. I'll so entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. All right.